Yeah, you look good, Norm. Is that any better? No. Hey, everybody on YouTube and Zoom. We'll, we'll get started here about 60 seconds and uh, look forward to our conversation today. Norm, Goose, you guys ready? Yep. Ready. Okay, just wanna welcome everybody to the USA Hockey webinar series presented by BioSteel and Pure Hockey. We got two great guests on today, former teammates at the University of Minnesota Duluth Bulldogs, D partners. So, you know, you know they uh, always had each other's backs. We have uh, Guy Gosselin, who is our ADM man regional manager, and he's actually a two-time Olympian and has uh, coached our uh, sled hockey team for quite a number of years. But now he's just, this past winter, he worked with our youth Olympic team for our 15 year olds. And that was, um, I'm hopefully Guy talks a little bit about that great experience. And then really have a pleasure to have on Norm McIver from the Chicago Blackhawks. Uh, he had a 12th season in the NHL three-time All-American at UMD because of Goose. So you could probably thank Goose for those <laughs> All-Americans. And then he was a Hobie, Hobie Baker finalist. And um, he just finished up his 13th season with the Chicago Blackhawks, three Stanley Cups, um, and his roles have varied. He was assistant coach prior to his time with Chicago, um, but then with his time in Chicago, worked in player development, player personnel, and now as assistant general manager. So uh, Goose and Norm, the show is all yours. Uh, remember, if you are uh, if you have a question, put it in the Q&A box or on YouTube, on the YouTube live chat. So thanks, guys. Hi, hey, Norman. Can you hear me? I can hear you, Goose. All right, brother. Thanks for coming on today. Really appreciate it. Um, and let me set the record state straight here, by the way. Uh, I was lucky to be on the ice with Norm. So thanks for the compliment, David. But uh, anyways, Norm had a fantastic career he's still involved in the game and um we've known each other for about 38 years now so that's a long time <laughs> <laughs> anyways going back a uh, little personal stuff here casual conversation in uh hockey development so going back to umd days i got a couple things to ask you about it um first time we met you're walking into the dorm we're both freshmen and you're carrying some stuff in and you have a Bobby Orr VHS. And uh, I'll always remember that because I thought that was a little bit different, but uh, um, didn't find out, you know, what the significance of that was until just a couple of years ago. But can you explain that a little bit to the uh, fans out there, Norm? Well, uh, I, was a, I was a defenseman and defenseman growing up and obviously growing up in the 1970s uh you know and, and i was an offensive defenseman and if, if you're going to be an offensive defenseman in, in the 1970s there was only one guy to try to follow and emulate and that was obviously bobby orr and so he, he i'd be honest with the goose he wasn't my my favorite player growing up was Guy Lafleur, but he was a forward with the montreal canadians but um you know i i just you know, Bobby Orr was kind of like during that time as I was growing up and he, you know, he's probably the greatest player of all time. And I just loved watching the video. I mean, I, I literally would watch it all the time and, and it was amazing. Every time I watched it, I seemed to be able to, I, I thought I could pick something up out of that video and try to implement it in my game, obviously never coming anywhere near that, but at least it was something I just, I loved watching it. It was sort of motivational, inspirational. And I used it kind of as a, 
teaching and learning tools, just anything that I could pick up. Um, it was amazing just watching it as many times as I did. I, I always sort of felt like, oh, there's something I hadn't seen before. So I, I just, he, he was an amazing player and uh, I just loved watching him play. And I didn't get to see him play live much because he retired. Or, I mean, on TV, he re basically retired when I was, you know, you and I were probably about uh, 10 or 11 years old. So we didn't, we didn't really, I don't remember the best of him. So the VHS tape was a lot of those highlights and, uh, it was a good opportunity just to see how, re how good he really was. So how long did that stick with you? How long were you watching the VHS? You know, I was watching those. I would watch them probably my first year and a half in the NHL. Now, I only, only obviously at home games. I you know, couldn't bring it on the road. <laughs> Didn't have a VCR to watch it. But certainly at, uh, at all the home games, I like to just throw it in there. About a, It was about 25 minutes long and then watch it and then uh, head on to the rink and just sort of, a little bit of inspiration and motivation to like, okay, you know, see what I can do out there and try to envision some of those things that I saw in the, uh, in the video. That's awesome. Um, next thing that was, I felt was a little bit different. Um, when you came in, you used a straight stick. Can you tell us some stories about, <laughs> uh, about your straight bladed stick? Yeah. Well, that started, I think it started, I might have been in Bantam hockey. And I think my dad just one day said, you know, you should try playing right-handed. I'm naturally, I shoot left. I am right-handed, but I, but obviously I shoot left. And he said, you know, it'd be kind of neat if you could play both hands. And uh, so he got this idea. And, and up until then, I had probably used a little bit of a curve on my stick. I mean, and you know, when you're whatever, eight, nine, 10, 11 years old, I'm sure you got a little curve because you want to be able to raise the puck. And then uh, suddenly when I was in Bantam, I went to a straight stick trying to see if I could uh, learn to play right-handed. And, uh, you know, I would, it was frustrating to try to, I mean, it was hard obviously to try to do. And, um, you know, I was telling you before Goose, I would, you know, when I would go play shinny or skate on the outdoor rinks, uh, depending on who I was playing against, I would, sometimes try to practice right-handed depending on the level of the competition. But uh, I never could really master it to the point where I felt comfortable doing it in a game other than maybe taking a shot. Um, but uh, it was just something to try. And, uh, you know, I think also because I felt like maybe I could stick in a little bit better with it. But after my freshman year at UMD, where I only scored one goal and realized I couldn't shoot the puck with that stick, uh, I, I finally switched to a curve my sophomore year. That's awesome. Um, would you be comfortable uh, telling a story about what happened in Hartford? Oh, so, yeah, so I'm sure everyone knows, uh, obviously everyone knows who Gordie Howe is and, and uh, Gordie Howe is ambidextrous, meaning he could, he could shoot equally as well, right or left-handed, probably could have played as well either hand. And I had just gotten traded to the Whalers and Gordy was working for the Whalers in some capacity. I don't know if he was like an ambassador or just sort of a, I'm not really sure exactly what he was doing. And, uh, but we had played a game that night, one night, and it was early on after I got traded there. And I hadn't met Gordy before. And a situation happened in the game where I was playing the right defense and left shot playing the right defense. And, the, and when the offensive blue line, the puck comes around on the boards on my backhand and rather than stopping it on my back and I just kind of switched hands real quick to stop the puck, keep it into the blue line and just fired a you know, fire. I just threw a wrist shot towards the net and uh, you know, nothing happened. But so after the game, I'm in my locker and I'm just getting changed. And I see Gordy Howe come in the dress room and I was like, oh, I'd never met him before. And it was pretty cool. And all of a sudden, next thing you know, he's, he's like walking right towards me. And I'm like, Dang, you know, like, and he comes over and he just stops, shakes my hand. He said, Hey, I really like that play you made at the blue line. I was like, wow. He noticed that. I was like, that's pretty cool. So that was, uh, that was pretty cool that, uh, that Gordy actually saw that. And I was always hoping to be able to score a goal right hand in the game. And I had one chance towards the end of my career, uh, off a rebound on my backhand. I tried to switch hands and shoot it, uh, but I missed the net, but I never was able to score a goal right hand. But I tried. That's awesome. That's awesome. Um, so again, when you came to D Duluth for the first time back in the early eighties, um, 
I'm going to be generous here and say that you weighed about 150 pounds. Um, That's being generous. Yeah. Yeah. Can you, uh, you know, in, 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 you started as a freshman, I think you're freshman of the year that year. Um, anyways, had a, had a great season, but, uh, you want to talk a little bit about navigating, uh, at 150 pounds and, um, you know, your approach to the game at that weight? Well, yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, I'd always been undersized growing up, so it's just something that I was used to. It never, I, I never thought of it really any different. It's just, you know, play the game the way I've always played the game. So I wasn't, um, never really worried about the size of the other guys. Obviously, you know, um, I realized later on that I needed to get a lot bigger and stronger if I was ever going to play to reach the level I wanted to get to in the NHL. But um, back then, it was just sort of something that I was accustomed to doing. And, and um, you know, all the way growing up as a kid, um, you know, like we didn't have triple A programs when I grew up. Was, everything was house league. I played house league really all the way till junior hockey because growing up in Thunder Bay, there was no triple A hockey. We were, it's a pretty isolated area of Northern Ontario. So there's not like a lot of areas you can go travel and, and play. So everything's right there in Thunder Bay. So they just basically split everybody up and you just played against each other. So, you know, I was, I was always kind of the kid that had the puck a lot and, you know, you know, you, if you get the puck, people are going to try to hit you. So you just kind of figure out how to, how to do it. And that's, that's the way I always kind of approach it. So coming to UMD, I, I didn't think it was any different. So getting creative outside now, um, you're telling me about the different ages, um, of the people that you used to play against out of the park and with the junior teams? Well, the, the junior team was kind of interesting because so at the time in, in, in Thunder Bay, this would have been like 1981, 82. Um, we didn't have a junior league. We made a junior team, but we didn't have a league to play in. Um, it was a few years later that Thunder Bay actually did join the USHL. And I think they were, I don't remember how many years they, they were in the USHL, but I know it was at least 15 possibly 20. Um, and they had some good teams, but when I was there, we had no league to play in. So in order for us to have games, they, they locally made a, a league uh, for us to play in. And it consisted of the, the university team, which still played in their university league, Canadian university league. And, you know, this are, these were guys basically between the ages of 21 and 26. And then in Canada in the 1970s, senior hockey was really big. And senior hockey was just, you know, it's basically men's hockey. These guys aren't getting paid, but, you know, they take it obviously very seriously, no different than American Hockey League, NHL. And it, the Allen Cup was a big trophy in Canada. And, and so Thunder Bay had always had a strong senior team. And so that year, they still had the one local senior team and they made another senior team. So there's two senior teams and the four of us played in a league. Now the senior team consisted of guys. There was, there was one player who was in his mid thirties who had played 12 years in the NHL. There was other guys that had played 10 years of pro hockey that were, you know, late twenties, early thirties um, combined on the two teams. There was probably, I would say more than a dozen players that had pro experience, whether it was the NHL, WHA, American hockey league internationally. And so as a 17 year old, and you're playing against men that have actually played against the best players in the world. Um, it was pretty cool. It was a pretty cool experience. And I actually, I said to this to you earlier, Goose, that when I got to college my first year in the WCHA, it was just like, I didn't really think it was that, I mean, I knew it was really good, but I, the players, I played against really good players the year before, older players. And so it wasn't that, I just didn't think it was that big a deal because that experience of having to play against those men and, you know, they weren't taking it easy on us. They, they played us, you know, it was a very competitive league and they, they played us hard, but it was just a great experience. Um, you learn so much. Like I remember my neighbor, one of my neighbors, he's about 10 years older than me. And he had, he had been a star junior player in the Ontario hockey league and a scoring champion. And his career had, had wound down and he came back to Thunder Bay and played, he played on one of those senior teams and, I just remember playing against him. It was like, you know, like I'm playing against a really good player here. And I remember I just 
if I was on the bench, I would always watch him and, and you know, just learn things that he was doing. And, and it, it, it happened to be just a great experience. Very fortunate the way it turned out. Awesome. Good story. Uh, moving on, talk about your team at UMD. You had some really good hockey players that you uh, had an opportunity to play with. Uh, uh, Bill Watson, Brett Hall, Tom Curvers, Matt Christensen. You know, those guys were all in your era. So many, many more. Um, can you tell me what you, you know, a, a takeaway, what you learned maybe, or what you appreciated uh, in regard to playing with those guys? Well, I think, like you said, Goose, I mean, and, and I would include you in that category as well. And, um, you know, I mean, obviously we had really good, really talented players and we had, we had a good team and, um, you know, we had back-to-back -back Hobie Baker winners and then uh, the following year, Brett Hall and myself were both nominated. So we had, you know, we had some good players and, uh, but I think the one thing that I, you know, that when I look back years later is that just kind of the way we played, it was a very unselfish team. Uh, you know, just felt like they, that we played the game the right way. Um, uh, it was never about, you know, individual stats. It was just about winning the games and playing the right way. And, and I always felt that it was just a really unselfish team, almost to the point where we made sometimes one too many passes because everyone was so unselfish. There was never a situation where it was like, you know, oh, this guy's got to score. We got to get him. To it was just, just played hockey. And, you know, we had a guy, a 700 goal NHL scorer, Brett Hall, and he was no different than anyone else. He played the game the same way that everyone else did. He was incredibly unselfish. Uh, and that didn't get noticed because he was such a phenomenal goal scorer, but he was an unselfish player. And uh, our whole team played that, that way. And we had, you know, Bill Watson, the Hobie Baker winner who scored, I, uh, I mean, his, his junior and or sophomore and junior season, he, he had, I think he had like almost 200 points in two years, of college hockey. I mean, it's just incredible, but same thing, very unselfish. And, you know, you'd think when you have players like that who, who put up a lot of numbers statistically, you would be like, okay, they're a little bit, little selfish players, but I, I never felt that. I always thought we were really unselfish and I really, I thought we played the game the right way. Awesome. So, We'll get off of the uh, college area in a, in, a, in a second here. But uh, one thing I, f I thought was interesting was, um, you know, we talk about power play. If everybody stopped working on power play in practice, we'd have some better hockey players. But with that said, can you tell us a little bit on how the power play evolved and um, kind of the, the things that you guys look for uh, in your practice? You mean like back at, at UMD? When yep. you were there? Well, you know, I, I have to look it up, Goose, but I think one year, we, I think we were like, we almost finished 36%. Some, it was some ridiculous number. Um, now, obviously, thing, you know, goaltending wasn't the same then as certainly as it is now. And um, the, the video and the, the amount of preparation and stuff like that to defend is, is a lot different today than it was then. But we actually started out and I would say it was my, towards the end of my freshman year that at the end of practices, we started playing this game. We used to call it the AHL, the Afternoon Hockey League. And basically it was, as soon as practice would end, there would be like four or five, and it was usually the four or five, of the better players on the team. And we would go down to one end of the ice and, and we loved because we'd take our helmets off, shoulder pads off, put, our, put these jerseys on. And then we'd play the poor freshmen or the guys that didn't get you know the guys that weren't on the lineup and we'd make them come down and and uh and we'd play against those guys and it was basically you know four-fifths of the power play was out playing this ahl game and, and you know we talked about this years later uh tom curvers and, and watson and myself and and it was playing those little in zone three on three game we, we split basically if the other team got the puck, they had to go outside the blue line before they could come in and score. And so we just play in the zone and, you know, we just, it seemed like we developed such chemistry, such little given goal plays and all this little stuff that just, we did this for like a couple of years, basically after every practice. And it seemed like that really helped us just kind of translate into the game. We just had this instinctive awareness of, of where everyone, you know, how the guys were going to react. And it was all sort of, 
is based on this little three on three game that we used to play. And, and we used to feel bad because it was like the third string goalie would have to go in there every day and he'd take a beating. And then the, you know, the guys, the poor guys that, that never got, that didn't get to play or they were freshmen. And um, you know, we, we used to hand it to them pretty good, but it really helped us with uh, on a couple of things. It, it, one, it helped us just sort of that, the chemistry, but also it was great for those guys that weren't playing because it made them feel a part of the team. It made them feel like they just weren't, you know, uh, uh, an extra player. They, they were part of this too. And, and so uh, looking back at it years later, it was uh, something that just happened, but it's something that was very beneficial for us. Okay, Norm, I'm starting to get some questions coming in here. Um, ch changing gears a little bit. Um, coachable is a term used often to describe players. Now, as you moved up through the ladder in pro hockey, were there less and less uncoachable players or even at the NHL level, those types of players are still there? Question mark. Uh, well, I guess it's what's your definition coachable is. I mean, so I have not seen um, really any, I didn't experience it, uh, situations like that where players, they say are uncoachable. To me, sometimes in coach speak is that uncoachable players are just players that maybe lack hockey sense. So they don't read the game, think the game um, the way that the coach wants them to do it. And from that standpoint, they might say they're uncoachable. But in terms of if you're talking about like sort of bad personalities or uh, just don't want to listen to the coach or whatever. I, I, I really didn't see a whole lot of it as a player. Didn't really see any of it as a coach and haven't really experienced it in Chicago um, in the management position. And, and certainly in, in my position, you know, I'm dealing with the coaches on a daily basis. So um, the only sort of uncoachable thing that, that you hear about is just a coach questioning a player's hockey sense and not being able being able to understand the game plan or, or whatever it is he's trying to implement. That's more than anything that, that I ever hear about. So with that said, um, can you discuss, just talk about role acceptance a little bit at the NHL level? Well, I think that's, it's critical for, for players. I mean, there's, you know, there's only so many Connor McDavid's and Patrick Kane's and, you know, those guys are so rare. Um, for a lot of players, the difference between the American League and the NHL is just finding out what it is that you're going to do to stay in the NHL and be willing to accept that role. And there's a lot of guys that for a number of reasons, it's hard for them to do. You know, if you grow up, if you're a scorer all the way up from the time you start playing hockey, right through high school, college, and even in the American League. But, you know, if, if you're in a position where you know, you might be a, a skilled right winger, but if there's two guys ahead of you in the depth chart and you're not going to take their spots, well, how are you going to make it in the NHL? How are you going to get in? And you've got to find, figure out a way. And sometimes, you know, sometimes players have to accept that role. And some guys are, are more than willing to do it. And suddenly they'll change their game and become a penalty killer, checker, whatever it is. And they'll have successful careers in the NHL. And other guys, um, you know, they just, they struggle mentally with, with that and for whatever reason they're just not quite at that level as the elite players and they can't seem to ever get their foot in the door because they're you know they, they're stuck to their this is the way they want to play the game versus the best way that they have a chance to make it in the NHL and, and you know sometimes it just it just doesn't happen for whatever reason good answer um moving on what would you say, and, and you don't have to, these don't have to be exact, but what are some of the best attributes or some of the biggest attributes that you look for in a player, um, you know, to play for the Chicago Blackhawks? Well, I think, you know, I, I, I'm not going to speak for the organization. I just kind of speak for myself. This is kind of like what I look for. I mean, every organization is different. Every scout, general manager, everyone has their own uh ideas and so forth but kind of what i do look for is and again this is very subjective but first thing i look for is hockey sense um and again it's it's you know how do you define hockey sense it's very difficult uh 
no one has the same definition. Uh, everyone sort of has their own opinion on what it is. So it's a very subjective uh, subject, but I kind of, that's really what I look for. I mean, I think, you know, you can go to a junior game or college game and you can watch the warmups and you can pretty much tell who can skate and whether or not a guy's got decent puck skills. You can handle the puck and shoot the puck. You can watch that in warmups. But what you, what you really, to me, uh, what I really would try to look for is obviously the hockey sense, the competitiveness of a player, and, and then sort of the mental toughness, which, uh, again, that's, you know, that's something you're not going to be able to see over one game. That's going to take some time to try to figure out. But um, it's really the, the, the three critical things that I look for, because, I mean, anyone can go to a, a practice, warm-ups, whatever, and you can tell who the good skaters are, and you can tell who the guys that can stick handle and shoot a puck, but it's, it's how you play the game. And, uh, you know, the, for me, the hockey sense is sometimes you have to watch a guy three, four times before something clicks and you go, okay, he's got it or mm, I'm not quite sure. Um, but that's, again, it's very subjective. Everyone has a different opinion on it. Uh, and that's what makes scouting so, so difficult. Norm, do you do, you do uh, much analytics on that for those players with your scouts or is it mostly your scouts? And no, we, well, we, on the amateur side, we do certainly on the amateur and pro side, we do. Um, and I think analytics, there are, you know, there, there's some, some good stuff this with analytics, but the, the, the issue, a little bit of an issue that I have is, is with analytics is sometimes you're not always comparing apples to apples. And sometimes it's you're comparing apples to oranges. And so it's not really necessarily a fair comparison. And so what I mean by that is, is so if you're, if we're doing it for the amateur scouting, you know, you might have, it's how can you rate analytically a kid playing say in, I don't know, Thief River Falls, Minnesota versus a kid playing in Russia or a kid playing in the Ontario Hockey League or someone out, out West. You can't, it's, it's almost impossible to do because the level of the competition is so dramatically different. So, um, from that standpoint, it, it's something that you got to be really careful of. Obviously, if you get you have an, you have a tournament where you have all the best players, okay, then you can certainly look at the numbers and see how the best players at a U18 or World Junior, you know how they did against each other. You can look at the numbers that way. But to try to do it um, for most of the kids for the draft is is it's really almost impossible because, like I said, the level of competition each are playing at is just so could be so dramatically different. So. Um, from that standpoint, I think it, it, it's you've got to be very careful how you use it. And and on the draft side, just, this is just interesting. How many people do you usually like list out, and how does that all work out from the draft? Like you're going in with this huge list. I think that's just you know crazy to think about how many kids that you guys have to scout throughout, and then you identify them. It's just cool. Well. <laughs> It starts out, the list starts out pretty big, but by the time we get to the draft, you'd be surprised. It probably gets down to about 70 names. Sometimes it's even a little bit less than that. And it's basically what we tell our scouts is don't put the kid's name on the list unless you want to draft them. Like just, just because, uh, you know, central scouting has them rated or red line report has this guy rated a certain spot. Um, if you don't want to draft him, don't put him on the list. So that's why our list, you know, it starts off in September or the, those first meetings either. I can't remember, usually in November, I guess. You know, the, there's a lot of kids on there. There's a lot. But it gets, as the season goes, goes along, it certainly gets whittled down. And then by, uh, you know, in a normal season, the draft would be in June. We would have our final meetings probably in May. And then again, uh, we'd have one last meeting a couple of days right before the draft. But, uh, but usually by the time we get to the draft table, it's about, around 70 names. And, and I remember the first time when I saw it like that, I was sort of like everyone else, like, we're going to run, you know, like we're going to run out of names. Right. But surprisingly we never have. So, um, you know, cause there's so many kids out there. And like I said, everyone has their own ideas, uh, their own opinions on the type of player they're looking for. And so, you know, we're going to have guys on our list that no one else will have and, and vice versa. So it's just the way it works out. So Norm, before I forget, we we're talking the other day about um, there's maybe a, a little bit too much structure in the game today, and um, you're a real creative player 
um, when you played the game, but growing up in Thunder Bay, with that said, uh, is there any coaching advice that, that kind of stuck with you over the years um, that you apply to your job today? Well, it, it, it applied certainly when I was coaching. Um, I had a coach when I played midget hockey in Thunder Bay. Now, midget hockey is, uh, that was grades uh, 10 and 11. We didn't, we didn't have high school hockey or, like I said before, we didn't have a triple A program. It was all, it was all house league. So um, it was 10th and 11th grade. And uh, my coach had played briefly in the NHL. And this was something that at the time, um, you know, looking back, never really realized it until years later, but he had played uh, a little bit for the Detroit Red Wings in the early 1960s. And uh, I think maybe he had played it a couple of half seasons, something like that with the Red Wings. So, you know, as a 15 year old kid, you're like, you hear about that and you don't, you're like, okay, that's kind of cool, whatever. But years later, when I thought about it, it was like, you know, back then there was only six teams in the league and NHL teams only carried five defensemen. So you're thinking about, he was one of the best top 30 defensemen in the game. And if you think about the NHL right now, you think of who the 30th best defenseman in the league is, he's pretty darn good. He's making a lot of money. So my coach was, uh, I obviously probably didn't think about it at the time, what a good player he must have been in his day. But um, he, he was just a, a great person, great coach. And he was a former defenseman. And he came up to me, well, it was my first year. So I would have been, I guess, in 10th grade, probably 14 or 15 years old, I guess 15. And uh, he came up maybe about a month into the season. He came up to me one day in practice and he just said, said, look, said, uh, you know, I've watched, been watching you play and, and you're a smart player. And he said, uh, he said, if you make a mistake, he goes, I know you're going to figure it out. He says, if you make the same mistake twice and don't figure it out, he says, I'll say something to you, but otherwise just go play. And I've always, that that's always just kind of stuck with me. It's like, you know, it's like, he just gave me that freedom to just go play. And, you know, and I, I kind of, when I got into coaching, I coached for six years. I coached for the American League first, and then I was an assistant in Boston for, for a few years. And I always kind of try to use that same approach that, you know, these guys, they make a mistake. They're going to, you know, if they don't see what the mistake they made, if they don't figure it out, if they don't realize it, then I'll say something. But otherwise, uh, I just wanted to, you know, most 90% of the time, they knew that they made a mistake. And, and as long as they didn't do it again, um, you know, I, I knew that they were going to, they were going to uh, make sure that didn't happen again. So I've always tried to just kind of have that philosophy to just let guys go play um, and the freedom to play and, and not worry about making mistakes. Cause that's, to me, that's the worst thing. And uh, you know, when you see it now in my position in management, you certainly it's, 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 you see it a lot with, especially with young players, you can tell the guys that are playing loose and free versus the guys that are just so, so afraid of making a mistake. It's, it almost paralyzes them when they go on the ice. And, and that's certainly the last thing I ever wanted to do when I was coaching. I didn't want anyone to sort of feel that fear of making that mistake and, and just go play it. So it's a reactionary game and you have to react. And so uh, if you're thinking about making a mistake prior to that, you're not going to be able to react and react in a positive way. So uh, with that said, Norm, we were talking a little bit about hockey sense and uh, situational practice the transfer to game so um you're not ne necessarily can teach hockey sense but you can prepare your players in that regard you want to discuss that a little bit well i've, I've always thought like, i've always wondered i like, just you know i'm like most people i'm a you know, fan of all sports and and uh obviously uh you know i like football baseball basketball and i've always kind of wondered it seems like when you, whether it's reading books or just kind of watching videos or whatever of other sports and, and just um, like even, you know, HBO has that uh, training camp thing that they had for years about the NFL team. They follow them around. And I've always wondered about in hockey, I've never seen, I never experienced as a player uh, and, and even as a coach, I always sort of wondered why we don't, work on situational play that much. And what I mean by that is not, not the power play, not a breakout, but sort of a, uh, you know, okay, you're, you're up by a goal with four minutes to go. 
okay, we're going to split the team and we're going to make the best players go against each other. And we're going to see how everyone reacts. And you're going to play the last four minutes. One team is going to be up a goal and the other is going to be defending and like, and, and put players in situations where they have to react and, and use that as a coaching tool. And, and, you know, there's a lot of times, most practices, you, you know, the first 20, 25 minutes are all skills, skating, passing, you know, shooting, stick handling, whatever. And then it seems like after that, it turns into, you know, one-on-ones, two-on-ones, three-on-twos, power play, penalty kill, and you're done. And, you know, in the NHL, they don't have the time. They, they just don't have the time to be able to do something like that. But I always wondered why at, at lower levels, uh, college, high school, I'm not just, maybe Bantam might be a little too low, but certainly high school and college where um, and you get that opportunity to get so much more practice to game time use that working on, on situations where coaches can really um, get a real feel for, for players and, and how they want to handle situations versus just doing standard regroups and three on twos and, and, and breakouts, put them in an environment where it's, it's competitive, but it's fun competitive, but it's also can be a, a real teaching, a real teaching tool. It's, it seems like it's something they do in other sports, whether it's football or basketball, I just never seen it in hockey and I've always wondered why. And, and you hear that often with a lot of other sports, soccer and all these sports around the world, you know, it's providing that environment and putting the pressure in different things that you can constrain or, you know, there's that scoreboard effect, you know, you can give points, right. additional points for, you know, doing something good on one team and uh, putting that, that fake pressure. We talked about it the last few weeks on some of the webinars that, you know, that's a good thing. We had a, a tennis uh, psychologist on, he was talking, how do you put pressure into tennis, right? You're just playing, there's no audience. He's like, Hey, this point could be 40 points for a first serve, you know, and, and somehow come up with ways that you build that pressure in somehow by manipulating score, manipulating the players there or any of those effects. I think that's, that's a really important part. And that's game, like realistic, right? Compete levels high. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt. Um, with that said, fun, competitive, even at the NHL. Well, it's you, it's hard because your your practice time is so limited, and the few practices you do get, um, you know, your your the practice in the NHL level is more about recovery. It's not. It's it's really you know the teaching is done in the video or in, you know, on the, on the board in the dressing room, it's not necessarily down the ice because they just don't have the time, the game, the amount of games, the travel, um, and then the mandatory days off per month that the players have to get, there's just not enough time to actually do that at the NHL level. I don't think, um, just, just because you've got to interrupt you for a second there, Norman, sorry. I, I, maybe I misspoke, but what I had intended on saying essentially is, NHL players, actually, it's important to have fun. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> At all you know, levels. Absolutely. I mean, they, they play that they play that goaltender game. Uh, our guys, ever since I've been here, they play that game at the end of the practice with the goalies. And it's like, it's, it's amazing how, how intense, how intense that gets. Uh, can I tell you one quick story about? So when I was playing in Pittsburgh in the, in the, in the mid 90s, um, and I uh, got a chance to play with uh, Lemieux and, and Yager. I remember Yager was a pretty young player at the time, and, and he would, uh, you know, I mean, he, he had a lot of, he had fun, and practices, I wouldn't say he was overly serious uh, in practice, and, and in Pittsburgh, they didn't really practice, you know, the practices weren't real hard, but it, it was funny. As soon as practice ended, he immediately wanted to play two on two or three on three down low in the zone because that's where he was really, and he would just, he would grab whoever would come play and he would play these little two on two, three on three. And, and those things would be ultra in, intense and competitive. And it was like, this was his way of like, okay, this is what I really need to work on to be, to be a great player. I need to be able to, to win these battles in the corners and, and take the puck to the net and give and go and all that stuff. And, and he would do that uh, all the time. And it was just, I, I remember the first time I saw it, it was, I'd never seen an NHL players sort of grab another guys and like, let's go play this little game. And, and he was the first one I, I saw it. And I don't, 
don't know how long he did that. I only played with him for, for about a year. And, and so that continue, I don't know, but it was something that was pretty interesting that he, he took that sort of get little game at the end of practice more competitively uh, than maybe the rest of practice, but it, it obviously paid off. He's you know, he had an incredible career. It's just like your the game that you played at the AHL after um, yeah. Minnesota Duluth, you know, very similar where, you know, it's super fun. You love it. All the players love it. And that's how you're going to get better. And that's where you're going to go longer than just, you know, your standard pass here, pass there, boring practice, you know, like that's. I got to, I got to tell you, Dave, we, we would look forward to that. Like you, like, so our coach, Mike Sertich, he was, he, he was ahead of his time guy. And I've talked about, he was ahead of his time in terms of conditioning. And on Mondays and Wednesdays, he would literally bag skate us goose my nut for an hour. Like he just bag skate us every Monday, Wednesday for an hour. And still we would just be like, as soon as that hour was, we just head into the dressing room, get our helmet and shoulder pads off, get that Jersey on. We just couldn't wait to go back out there and play our little AHL game because like you said, it was so much fun. It was competitive and we didn't know it at the time, but it was, we were developing that chemistry that really, that really made a difference uh, for us as a team. That's awesome. Um, it, it, it's I similar like those. Uh, here, David. Uh, sorry, I was just saying it's similar like other sports. You know, you hear about people in um, football or soccer in other countries. They're playing on the street, and that's their practice, and they become so good and so unbelievable because they they're doing these little games, you know, just on their own, and it's not not as much what you do as a coach, right? It's, you know, their own ownership and. Well, I was, I was telling, I was telling Goose this story earlier today. Like when I was in high school, uh, no, we, you know, Thunder Bay, obviously because of the climate, you know, we have a lot of outdoor rinks. So I had that advantage of being able to use outdoor ice. And so whenever I wanted, obviously in the winter time, but I looked forward to Saturdays more than anything when I was in high school, because on Saturday afternoon, there was about five or six of high school teachers of my school that would come and we'd play shinny on Saturday afternoons on the outdoor rink. And it, I was just like, that was awesome. That was like the best thing. It was like, there would be like maybe 15 players out there, but five or six of them would be teachers from my high school. And it was like, I just, that was awesome. It was just, it was the coolest thing. And, you know, they were at the time, they were probably only in their mid twenties, maybe late twenties at the most. Uh, but just still to go out there and, and just play shinny hockey, you know, 15 guys, one puck, let's go. And we're going to play two teams and we just played. And it was, it was absolutely couldn't wait for Saturday afternoons to go out there with the, the teachers. Awesome memories. Um, Norm, you got to take one question here. Uh, would love to get your thought on evaluating players, including goalies in an open tryout format. Outside of the usual hard skills, what are some of the other qualities you try to look at and how do you go about structuring the sessions to test it? Who? Yeah. That's, that's a tough question. Uh, well, uh, first of all, I'll say this on goalies. I know nothing on goalies. I don't pretend to know anything on goalies. So I just leave the goalie stuff to someone that does because um, that's for me, that's just, it's an area I just don't know enough about, so I don't even pretend to try to know. Um, we had Peter Aubrey. Fun. We had Peter Aubrey on um, a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> and he he was terrific. He was, and if you haven't watched it, um, the people on YouTube or wherever you're watching this, he was very very good, and he was very um, real life with all the the goalies and the people watching. So he was a good one, good hire. Yeah, well, Peter, Peter's a, he's a good guy, and he's, he's done a really he's done a really good job for us. Uh, he mostly works with our goaltenders in Rockford, our American League team, and he also works with our prospects that uh, that we've drafted are either playing college or, well, actually, they're basically playing junior. He, he doesn't really have access to the college goalies, but um, uh, yeah, he's 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 done a terrific job for us. But in terms of the open trial, boy, that's um, you know I I just remember. Oh, it was probably about seven or eight years ago. And my son, who after high school, he he tried out for a few different North American League teams. And I remember going to watch, going with him. And there was probably 80 to 100 kids there. And it was like, I was, I was thinking like, how, how do you, how do they evaluate this? I, it was, I think that's really difficult. Um, 
uh, obviously to try to do it in a couple of days is very difficult. That's, that's a really hard question. I'm really not sure I have an answer for that when you have an open trial with that many kids. Uh, obviously, I think you need a lot of evaluators. You need the input of the, the people that are on the ice working with the kids. Obviously, I think, I think you're, I think that, I think the people that are on the ice might have a better understanding, a better idea of, of who, um, you know, who the, the kids are versus somebody trying to evaluate from, uh, from the stands. So maybe it's just, uh, you know, the on ice, the people that are on ice, having more people on ice so that you get a better feel for really what's going on down there. It's a good question though. <laughs> uh, so kind of off of that, um, uh, I think a player from, somewhere on YouTube asked question for the young norm. You are a young player and a few teams want, want you, which would you choose and why? And how do you go about maybe choosing some teams? That's a pretty good question. Choose like who I want to play for. Who would you want to play for? What would you look for in um, teams that you are being asked to play for? Well, yeah, that's a really good question. It would probably, what would suit, uh, my strengths and, um, you know, and play, play a style that would, that would suit the way I play. And also probably an organization that, uh, is a, you know, that the accepting of someone that's, uh, you know, obviously a smaller defenseman, they're not afraid of, of putting a smaller defenseman in the lineup. So that's kind of what I would have to look at it. And the other thing would obviously be opportunity and, um, you know, where, where the, where the opportunity is, but also where, the best fit is. And, uh, you know, I, I did have that situation coming out of college. I was a, I was a unrestricted free agent. And uh, so I did have actually two teams that were very interested in signing me. One was the Edmonton Oilers and one was the New York Rangers. And, uh, uh, you know, the Oilers at the time, that was Wayne Gretzky and Mark Messier, Paul Coffey. It was right in the middle of their uh, dynasty, their five Stanley Cups in seven years. It was right in the middle. And looking back, I ended up signing with the Rangers because the opportunity was there. But looking back on it now, um, I ended up playing for the Oilers a few years later. It probably was the it, sh it probably would have been the better fit for me at the time. But I didn't I didn't realize that the most important thing was the fit. And I went for the opportunity. And you know, I, I think if I had to do it over again, I mean, I don't. I enjoyed playing for the Rangers. I had a great time there, but um, you know, it would have been pretty cool to play on that Oiler team with Gretzky and Messier. And uh, I did get to play with Messier and a few of those other guys, but that was at the end of the end of the dynasty. But I think fit is probably uh, more important than anything else. Norm again, I think we're getting close to wrapping up here, but uh, you've had a chance to work with some great coaches and managers over the years. Can you name one or two of them and, and explain why they were so great? Well, well, you know, I've been around, uh, well, I got a chance to work obviously with Mike Sullivan and uh, when we were together in Boston and Mike has gone on to win a couple Stanley cups with the penguins. Um, and, and obviously being around Joel Quenville uh, for, I guess, I don't know, 12 years in Chicago and, and, um, you know, the other person being around in Chicago was Scotty Bowman. Scotty works for the team as a senior advisor. And, and uh, you know, S Scotty, especially uh, when we had those deep playoff runs, um, he was there for all the playoffs. And so, you know, you get a chance to spend a lot of time with, with uh, I got a lot of chance, or a chance to spend a lot of time with Scotty. And, and I think the one thing that I, that I kind of really learned um maybe that I, I didn't quite know when I first got into coaching, certainly in the NHL level was that, you know, at that level, and I'm, I'm sure it is at, you know, when you're trying to win at whatever level, but it's, it's really understanding your best players, understanding what your best players do and how do you get the most out of your best players. And then it's more that you've got to tailor what you're doing to maximize the results from your best players. If you're trying to fit them into what your system is, might not work, but what I learned from, from watching Joel, from listening to Scotty and, and certainly seeing the way Mike is, is uh, the way he's doing things in Pittsburgh now, uh, 
you know, maximizing your best players. To me, that's what it's all about. And I, I don't know if I, I quite understood that when I first got into coaching and certainly even in the NHL, but uh, you know, you don't, <laughs> you, you look at what you have and then you try to take what you have and make the absolute best of it. You don't necessarily, you know, a lot of coaches have these ideas of systems that they're going to play and they're going to implement. And you'll hear it, a, you know, a new coach is hired and you know, you'll watch the press conference. And the first thing he says, is, well, this is the way we're going to play. Well, that's great. But what if you don't have the players that can play that way? You know, it makes things a little difficult. So with, with these two guys, especially Scotty and, and Joel, and just listening to them and, and watching them and being around it is they've realized who their best players are. And they, they found a way to maximize their best players because, you know, the rest of your team is going to, you know, all of us have sat in a dressing room. You know who the, the good players on your team are, right? And, you know, that's that's what makes your team tick. Your best players make your team go. And, and the rest of the guys, they're just going to fall in the line. If your best players are playing it, everyone else is just going to follow along. So, you know, at, the, at that highest level, the coach is, really needs to just focus, for the most part, on making sure that his best players are, are playing at their maximum potential. And if they are, then you're going to have a chance to be really successful. And that's what I witnessed in Chicago and uh, and certainly listened to Scotty and, and gone back and, and watched some of his old tapes and after things he said, and you're like, oh, now I know exactly what he's talking about. And uh, it was obvious why they were successful. Awesome. Student of the game. David, how are we doing? We're doing pretty good. We, um, if you have any, any questions, throw them in the Q&A. We're going to wrap it up here pretty shortly. But um, so uh, I have a question for you, Norm. When you are, are um, when you were working in player development, player personnel, and you were there to develop your players, how did how was that different from when you were a assistant coach, and was there a difference? Yes, there's definitely a difference. So, what, what, how how I approached it, and 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 how I think this is just my opinion, how I think it should be approached. So, at the NHL level, you know, we draft these kids, and you know, technically they're our property. Um, the rare exception is signed right away and and play in the NHL. They either go play in junior or they go play college or they go they're back to Europe and play. So I always felt that, you know, you can't take away from where they are right now. Meaning, you know, it's going to be a great experience, whether they're in college, whether it's junior, sweet, like that should be, that should be their focus. Their focus should be on where they're playing, their teammates, uh, their coaches, everything. And from a, a organizational standpoint, our, our view should have been, at least the way I approached it, was that I'm just going to talk, when I talk to a player, I just want to give him long, sort of the big picture uh, view on what he might need to do to be a successful NHL player. For example, I wasn't going to get into, you know, hey, you know, on the four check, you got to go this way, or, you know, on the bat, you got to back check harder, or you got to do this, or your stick position. I, I, I didn't want to interfere in any way with with what the, uh, the player's coach was doing. But if it was something that, look, you're 170 pounds, if you're gonna play in the NHL, you've gotta get in the next three years, you know, you're gonna to have to put on 15 pounds or you're gonna, or your conditioning is, isn't what it needs to be. If your body fat's a little high, like, look, you're gonna to have to take this a lot more seriously, nutrition wise. So it was always sort of big picture stuff and not getting involved in their team what their coaches were telling them, what they were working on, because I didn't think that was fair to their coaches uh, for one thing and fair to their team, but uh, I didn't want them to focus on, oh, here's what the Blackhawks are saying. I wanted them to just like, hey, you're a London Knight or you're a UMD Bulldog or you're a whatever, and that's what you should focus on. And, but, oh, by the way, I'm just going to give you this piece of advice that, you know, for you to have a successful NHL career, you're going to have to, at some point, you're going to have to like realize that this is what's, it's going to have to happen for you to be an NHL player. And that's kind of the way I, I try to approach it. And I try to instill that with the guys that we have right now. Um, you know, don't get, don't get involved in terms of what their coaches are telling their players, because you don't want to, that's the last thing you want to do. Just give them big picture strategy of what it's going to take for them to reach their goal of playing in the NHL. That's good advice. That's interesting. 
you know, uh, on that. Um, so Goose, um, we're going to wrap up, but usually before we go, I always ask our, our guests one question. I don't know if Goose has given you a heads up yet on this question. So he's trying to throw you a curveball. This is for all the times you put him in the corner to get that puck out. And you said just to stay out in front and just pass him the puck. So here, here's, here it is. Um, if you had a time machine to go back in time and ask a young Norm McIver, when you first started coaching and kind of gotten on your journey on the front office side, what would you tell him um, that what you know now? Ooh. Um, wow, Dave, that's a great question. What would I tell him? Oh, you know, uh, do what you love. Stick with it. Um, enjoy the process. Um, you know, it's like it's it's an unpredictable business. You never know where it's going to take you. So uh, just really go in there and, and enjoy it. Have fun. Work. And above, and to me, uh, more than anything else, this is a player's game. Let them play, you know, give them what they need to, what you need to give them, and then sort of get out of the way and let them, let them go play and, and, and do their job. And uh, uh, dang, that's, that's a good question. I never really thought of that before, but yeah, I, I think it more or less just enjoy it. Uh, don't worry about, you know, where you are in the process because you know what? You never know what's going to happen. Um, I, I would never, I personally would never expected this for me. Um, so you just never know. Just go have fun, enjoy it, work hard, and um, respect this great game that is uh, that we're all get to be a part of. Awesome. Thank you very, very much for your time, Norm Goose. Um, and okay. really appreciate Thanks, it. And hopefully, we'll see your team soon. Um, <laughs> in a couple of weeks. That's what we're hoping. Everybody's hoping we want some hockey, but yeah, I hope so too. It'd be that's great. A, that's a whole nother webinar. Um, <laughs> to talk about anyways. Thanks again, everybody for watching. And we're back next week, three 30 all week, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Eastern time. Um, you can watch all the recorded webinars on, uh, YouTube, uh, dot com slash USA hockey or on our ADM Facebook page, American development model and follow at USA hockey coach. But thanks again. We hope you have a great weekend. Um, and we look forward to seeing everybody next week. See ya. Thanks Dave. Thanks. Trying to, trying to end it. Not coming up one second. Are we ended? <laughs>